feeling was, look, you know, for most, Israel, most, most of our readers, if you actually take total readership, are actually overseas. The, by far the majority of the readers were, were in the United States or Canada or Britain or Australia or wherever. Um, and these readers are probably not so interested in um, real nuts and bolts uh, political stories um, that you know, they'll just sort of scratch their head and say, who are these people? Why do I care about this municipal judge or whatever? And so I did try to reorient the paper when I was editor to dealing with some, some larger stories about, um, about that I thought were, would be more interesting to, to, that, to that readership. That isn't to say you know, I, I utterly neglected the kind of nitty gritty of, of, of Israeli life, but I thought the issues really were security, um, relations with uh, the Palestinians, uh, the wider Arab world, um, some, some stuff on, uh, on, on the economy, particularly economic, uh, economic reform, um, but some of these kind of big issues about conflict, terrorism, Israel's identity, um, anti-Semitism in Europe, those sorts of things, which really engaged and energized um, overseas readers. Um, you know, and that was, that, was, that was the choice that I made as, as editor, and I, I think it's, it was a defensible and right one, but every editor will, will see, see the paper somewhat differently. The Wall Street Journal has a big internet audience, people who pay for it, actually. What's it cost a year to subscribe just to the online? You know, I don't know. Um, I know you get I, a break <laughs> if you buy the paper, but... Uh, uh, I wish, I, I, I probably should have those figures. The question I really mind. want to ask you, though, is how, how important is the Internet and how often do people read you on the Internet versus in the hard copy? Well, um, I think we're approaching the last figures I saw. Um, uh, we were approaching close to 800,000. Maybe we'd broken 800,000 paying subscribers on on the internet, which would make it, if it were just, if that were just a newspaper alone, it would make it one of the largest newspapers in the United States, about the size of the Washington Post, maybe approaching the LA uh, the the LA Times. Um, it's obviously a, a hugely important segment uh, or or uh, media um, because you know there's a sense that that is where. The dissemination of news is is going, and because the transactional costs of putting up online are less, and because you can be so much more interactive or do so many more things when you're working in electronic, in an electronic format rather than, uh, rather than a paper format. So my impression is that, you know, WSJ.com is is a very big part of what what the Wall Street Journal is and where it sees its its uh, future. In terms of uh, in terms of the um, readership, this is a bit difficult for me to gauge. Um, I mean, for instance, my my Benedict column. We we have this thing in which we track the most viewed, most emailed articles on uh, on the web, and the Benedict column and the one that preceded uh, that both were, I think, the uh, at one point the fifth most emailed or viewed. I'm not I don't quite remember uh, article for the week in, in the Wall Street Journal. So obviously it's being read and disseminated uh, at WSJ.com. On the other hand, one of the things I'd done in, the, in my Benedict column is I'd asked the, the WSJ.com people to put a link to the full text of the speech in, in the electronic version of the article. And a lot of the letters I got were, were from people saying, really liked your, 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 uh, your piece. I'd love to read the full article. So clearly they were reading the paper edition Noticed my email address at the foot of the of, of the paper edition, and then and then were going online, but weren't subscribers. So I I guess I wish more of them were online subscribers. Married, two children. When did you get married? Who did you marry? Where did you meet your wife? <laughs> um, uh, my wife uh, I met at uh, in Israel. Uh, she is um, uh, German by nationality, raised in Belgium educated in Britain, got her PhD in Italian Renaissance literature at Cambridge, um, doing work on a Jewish uh, figure from 17th century Venice, uh, poet and sort of cultural figure of her day by the name of Sarah Copio. I met her in Israel. Um, we were married uh, in 2003. 
and uh, later that year my daughter Lara was born in Jerusalem she's now I just uh, took her to school this morning she's a growing uh, uh, thing <laughs> a little wonder and uh, then a couple years later or I should say about 19 or 20 months later my son was born uh, Noah who is uh, 15 months old what kind of a world do you think they're gonna live in and that, what I mean by that is to give us your philosophy of what's going to happen with what we're faced with today over in the Middle East. Well, I, there are days, um, I live in Manhattan, and there are days when I think, do I really want my family in Manhattan? Um, especially when I've been doing some reporting recently on um, nuclear pro proliferation and uh, uh, talking to some some experts on the subject of terrorism and WMD and the ease with which terrorists might um, acquire uh, WMD. I just finished reading uh, for review an excellent book by a BBC reporter by, uh, named Gordon Carrera called Shopping for Bombs about the AQ Khan proliferation network and uh, you th and you think to yourself boy this stuff is out there and um, this is the number one, New York City is the number one target in the world and even now with all the police presence and, and the awareness after September 11th, it's such a porous place, it seems almost improbable that something, that another 9-11, a much worse 9-11 might not visit the city. Do I really want my, my family here? I mean, if I go to work in it, okay, but maybe I don't want my children in it. On the other hand, I think, well, if I start thinking this way, then it's really all downhill. And I'll tell you, when I lived in Israel, I lived there during really the height of the Intifada. There were a whole series of bus bombings, cafe bombings, um, very close to where I live, really down the street. Um, our favorite cafe, uh, basically our, our neighborhood coffee place was, two of our neighborhood coffee places were bombed. Um, I witnessed one one bombing up close, and but what you what what you realize there, or what I realized there in Jerusalem, is if you start operating on the belief or in the fear that terrorists could get you, it paralyzes your life and it makes life genuine, genuinely unlivable, and it and it essentially gives the other guys the victory that they seek by perpetrating terror. So I think uh, most Israelis, and I, I think this was true for, for, for my wife uh, and for me, um, just decided that we weren't going to think about it, that we weren't going to let it run our lives um, and, uh, and uh, um, sort of be the structure in which, in which we lived. And that creates a kind of, I guess you'd call it a kind of healthy fatalism. Um, you know, you say what will be will be, and in the meantime, you get on with your life as you wish to live it. And I would say that that's sort of what I hope for my, uh, for my uh, uh, kids as well, that they, they operate with the, same, with the same broad principles, whatever it is they want to do, wherever it is um, uh, they wish to live, that they not um, allow themselves to be intimidated or terrorized or feel reduced about what their possibilities in life might be. Um, so I guess that's, that's a kind of way of connecting the personal and the political but I think that that's that's true of the way I feel. Got any sense of what this country will do this year in politics in the election? Um, no. <laughs> the uh, uh, first of all my beat really isn't politics so it's I, I'm, I'm about as informed as, as the next guy about whether say you know uh, Chafee's gonna pull it out or um, you know, steel in Maryland will will uh, will uh, will do well, or what will happen in the Tennessee Senate race. I mean, I guess I could make an amateur prediction and say that I think that the Republicans will keep control of of both houses um, with much slimmer majorities. Um, but I would say this, I think, with more confidence. I think that if I were um, a card-carrying Democrat, rank-and-file Democrat, the last thing I would want is for this. Democratic congressional leadership to come into majority positions because that will play very well for Republicans two years down the road when the stakes are bigger. Why? Because I think that uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid cut very unattractive political figures. Um, I know neither of them 
so again, it's, this, is, this impression is, is a, a surface one. Um, but you get the sense when you're listening to Pelosi that, she, that, that she's dreading the follow-up question because she doesn't know. Um, there's, there, there is a kind of shrillness about um, her style of politics as well as, as, well as Harry Reid's. Um, and also a bit of a hollowness. I remember some months ago now, um, Pelosi came out with this contract for America's security. So, you know, you take a look at this document, and it's kind of, it's problem. It's, it's you know, increase, increase, uh, increase benefits for veterans and, and check ports and everything you've sort of heard endlessly on, on cable TV and on, uh, and on top talk shows. And it doesn't come across as particularly informed and particularly serious. And I do think the Democrats have to do a better job of getting seriously aboard the war on terror and saying, um, and, uh, and uh, my colleague Peg Noonan said this very well. She said, this is how we're going to do it better. And you hear that occasionally from Democrats. But what you really hear, I mean, the kind of broad meta message is uh, we're going to get out of Iraq. And we're going to sort of, it's going to be a kind of come home America um, moment. And I think that's, 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 um, that's uh, not a good message for the, for the Democrats to have. You know, um, I did one column on a book uh, called With All Our Might, which is a compilation of essays put together by Will Marshall of the Progressive Policy Institute. And Will is a card-carrying new Democrat. Um, at part of the movement that really helped create the, the Clintonism, if you will. Um, and one of the points he makes in our book, uh, in, in his book, uh, is that, you know, our honor and our interests as Americans say that we have to stick it out in Iraq. We have to make this succeed. We can't retreat in a moment of defeat and humiliation and ignominy because the consequences will be really very serious. And it's, it's a good thing to hear Democrats like, like Marshall say just that. I think that message has to get across more, more, more broadly. One thing that I am heartened by is what seems to be Joe Lieberman's strength in, in Connecticut. Um, uh, it, it displays a kind of, I think, healthy instinct of, among voters, that you want Democrats, just like Joe Lieberman, certainly critics of the administration, um, certainly you know, true to their democratic values on social and economic policy, but who at least are willing to be a bit bipartisan um, beyond the water's edge on, on the great issues of the day, and to be the kind of Arthur Vanderbergs, uh, Van Vanderbergs of, their, of their era, you know, the, the Republicans during the Truman administration who said, we're not going to retreat into isolationism. We're not going to do what we did after the First World War. We are going to participate in Harry Truman's Cold War. We're going to participate in containment. We are going to support the institutions, the broad structures that carried America through the Cold War. And there has to be that kind of basis of bipartisan consensus and people who, who, who really walk the walk, like, like Lieberman, I think in order to succeed in, 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 the war on, uh, in the war on terror. I mean, this book by Marshall that I mentioned, I could read it and I could say, I disagree with this, I disagree with this, and this guy's wrong, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But at least the basic spirit of it, um, the, the, the gist of it, I think was absolutely right and absolutely um, important for the country and for the Democratic Party. Brett Stevens, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.